they continue to grow and you have a group asking them what's important for our success, who we are, how we act, what we do. And here's why it's important that, that the players participate in this. It's kind of like this. Ha have you ever rented a car? Right? You've probably all at some point rented a car. And how many of you have waxed and shined it before you gave it back? <laughs> why? Because it wasn't yours. So if the players are being handed values that maybe they don't feel like they have ownership in, will they truly take care of it? Will they wax and shine when it needs to? Right? So as we develop what our, our values are, as we develop what we want to use as our guide on that path, how we get them to help participate in and shape, you know, what it needs to look like. Okay? So I, I love coming in and it's changed. It's, it's interesting because last year was much different with Charlie. Was anybody in here last year? Yeah. Yeah, does anybody remember what it said? No guns. No guns. Yeah, no guns. That was one of them. No guns. No drugs. Respect women, right? So it stayed with you. You remember it. It, it you processed it. And for all the guys that come in here and see these walls, it's, it's important. Here's, here's the other thing that I think is also quite interesting. Is, is when, know, with Charlie, message. how many were there? Do you remember? Fewer. Like right. Four or five. There were four, right, that were very distinct ones. As you look around, and this is just a, a, a different philosophy, as you look at it, is it too much to take in, too much to process? How much will the players really, when they leave here, go, got it, got it? Charlie's group probably knew the four, would you say? Yeah. They probably knew the, the value. We'll come back to that in, in a second. Um, from this morning, any big takeaways for you? Anything that hits you? Anything of value that may be useful? And the reason why I'm asking is you might have picked up on something that somebody else didn't. All right? Anything that you saw, any <coughs> of the sessions that you thought were of value. The main turn that was used during all of the playing time was that with one foot and then turning face to the onboard and uh, onboard system. So the, 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 what, he, what he said was this, was getting on the half turn is what they said. That if you can imagine a line of players, right, that are midfielders, a line of players that are backs, and usually teams play in some kind of shape. And we talk about this in our players. When you play in between that line, can you gain an advantage? Because what you've done now is play maybe three, four, five guys from the other team out of the game. You played them out of the game by passing to somebody in between the lines. Now, if in our first touch we haven't faced that back line, now our first touch is in the direction where it came, and it's playing all those guys back into it. So getting on that half turn, teaching your players, one, to have that look first, know what's there, so they can get on that half turn, and now how effective when they turn and face that, maybe the last line of defense. Much more effective. And we saw that, whether it was in Mario's passing pattern, right, or in that last session of helping our players understand how to handle play in between the lines. And here's the other thing, I'll add this. That ball into them is so important. We talk to our players about passing time on. In the game of soccer, everybody would like to have more time on the ball, right? More time and more space. It would be, I would still be playing if I had unlimited time on the ball. <laughs> the reality was, as I got a little bit slower, that time came a little bit less. Here's one way that we can help the next guy is that we deliver him a ball as fast as we can. Not when I feel like giving it, when he needs it. 
So if the ball comes through me, and rather than taking five or six touches, I take one and then two and the next one deliver it, how much more time does he have? A lot. Now if he does the same thing in delivering the next one, and he does the same thing in delivering the next one, now that guy that may be on the other side of the field, if we all took five, had the defender right on top of him, now has time and space, now we've all helped him on and we've passed on time. So that ball that's played into this guy between the lines needs to be a ball that's played firm, timely. When he checks into that space that it's coming so he can get on that half turn and go at it. Passing time on. And teaching our players that, look, it's not just okay to deliver the ball to somebody on your team, but to deliver it when they need it. Not when you feel like it, when they need it. And I think that, that goes head in hand with it. What else? Anything else? Sure. Sure. Ben, what, what he was saying was head on the swivel and looking at what's around you. How hard is that? Look, and here's why. Is when we watch a game on TV, what are we watching? The ball. The ball. Because we don't want to miss any of the action. Right? Our players many times are trained to simply watch the ball. But what happens is we miss those opportunities then to participate better in the game. We end up being spectators rather than participants. We need to help them learn how to be better participants by as the but here's when when can we take our eyes off the ball? When do you think a good time is? When do you think a good time was maybe to take a look? Take a look. Ball in the take a look. When the ball's moving. When the ball's moving. From one person to the next. Right? So the ball's being played from the, from the left back to the left center back. And as that ball's being played, I'm looking. Alright, I'm moving and I'm looking. And I'm moving and I'm looking. Alright? Those are the times that we take that. Now there's a guy... Um, I'm going to try to uh, get the name right. Gare Jordan. G-E-I-R. And his last name is uh, J-O-R-D-E-T. If you have something to write with, write it down. Gare Jordan. <coughs> right? This is great for the higher level coaches because he does a seminar, a whole seminar, Norwegian guy, on simply field awareness. And the whole seminar is on this. On how many times guys look before they get the ball. <coughs> and, and in their study, what they found is this. Not a big surprise, youth level players look far less than professional players. Not a big surprise. Well, here's what they also find, is this. Is those players that look more end up playing more forward passing. <coughs> now, how much more effective? Because what happens is, by looking more and knowing where you are, you probably give yourself more time on the ball. Imagine this. I have never looked. I received the ball. Now, with the first touch, I have to figure it all out. So getting our players to have that awareness, not just as attacking players, but defenders as well, of looking looking and being aware, training the soccer brain, picking up information, picking up the ball again, picking up information, picking up the ball again, and now discerning and making decisions based on all of that. There's no way you can develop it other than training it and practicing it. Good. Anything else for this morning? Yes? Uh, not only being aware of how your movement affects your team, but how your movement affects the, your team. Yes. Yes. <coughs> very good. That's that's very hard. Again, youth players, young players, when you're coaching eight, nine, uh, mentally they have a tough time picking that up. 
and understanding that because right now at a, a seven, eight, nine, they probably don't understand the world much beyond themselves, right? They, they're not thinking beyond, that's why when they get the ball, guess what it is? It's me and the ball and I'm going, right? That's it. What, play to somebody else? Why are you kidding? I just got the ball. <laughs> As they grow older, that connection to other people, that my movement into one space opens up another space. Or furthermore, I shouldn't run into that space because somebody else is there. So understanding that, and that helps, again, obviously with the development of the brain, but that's something else that needs to be trained as well. Good. Anything else? Yeah. I'm always impressed with the uh, positive reinforcement. I don't do the best job of uh, hiding my frustration sometimes, and there's no negative comments here ever. All right. How many other coaches feel like that's a challenge? I'm raising my hand. I'll raise my hand. Because our natural instinct is this. We, what do we want to do? We want to fix things. As coaches, we want to fix things. If something's going wrong. If I'm not out here fixing things, am I really needed? Should I be out here if there's not something to fix? That's our perspective. So if we're looking to fix things, what do I have to find? Things that are wrong. I have to identify. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong, which tells me I'm needed. But it may not be what they need to hear. There's a, there's a book, and some of you have heard of this, Well Done. All right, if you haven't read it, read it. As a leader, as a coach, as a teacher, it's called Well Done. W-H-A-L-E, Well Done. And here's the premise of the book about how they train killer whales, when they first started doing this, how they train killer whales in SeaWorld. And what they do is wait, they'd actually take killer whales, the most dangerous predators in the sea, put them in captivity, and then train them to do what they want. And it's pretty incredible how they would do this. And what, what they would do, like for example, if they wanted them to jump out of the water over a rope, all right, what they would start by doing is put the rope about 10 meters off the bottom of the tank. And every time they would swim over it, they would love it, hug it, and feed it. Then they raise it another 10 meters, and every time it swam over it, they love it, hug it, and feed it. Pretty soon the thing was jumping over the rope 10 meters outside the water. Why? It wanted to be loved and hugged and fed. Now, if it swam under it, what they didn't do is whip it because they knew they'd be eaten. <laughs> what they did do was this. They would redirect their behavior. Redirect their behavior to catch them doing it right. And then they would love them and hug them and feed them. So when you talk about positive reinforcement, is are we catching them doing it right? Or do we have the tendency to catch them doing it wrong? And my experience has been there's much more power in catching them doing it right. Do we have to redirect behavior of a parent? Yes. 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 And I'd be the first to admit there's sometimes you know what, I'm reacting to that, don't always redirect it as positively as I'd like. But I know the reward of when you redirect it and catch them doing it right. We are naturally people that want to be caught doing it right. Reinforced, well done, keep going. That's exactly how it needs to be. And the likelihood is when you catch them doing it right, they'll probably end up doing it again. Good point, well done. Anything else from this morning? Yeah. I think one of the good things to keep hearing over and over from all the coaches was about how, you know, we talk about with the kids all the time raising the bar, but doing it as coaches to make everything game realistic. I think Mario kind of summed it up when he said, don't train what doesn't exist. You know, because a lot of times you see so many activities that are possession for possession's sake or finishing just to finish, yeah. but how realistic is it to the actual game? So it was good to hear that emphasized over and over and over. Thank you, Fong
Exactly. Right? Make it functional. What you're doing, there should be some relation to the game, or at least something you're looking to get out of it that will benefit the, the, the group towards what they want to do. <coughs>
there, there are there are moments, right? Moments, these chunks of time, these these times that aren't aren't massive, that we can sit with our team and and be able to maybe move them, give them direction, simply communicate with them. And this is one of the great challenges as coaches, is how do we use these moments of time that are actually critical time? Maybe before training, after training, right? Pre-game, post-game, how about halftime? Moments of time where we need to communicate with our team. And then what does that look like? And I know for me as a coach, my greatest growth came in handling those moments and what they look like. This wasn't this wasn't me. This was this was why this is not this is not how to do it. This is not how to do it. Here. Half time in my home the stadium in Montreal, Mexico, by two goals to nil. Are you ready for the class?
So then, having thought about that, what does, what does the pregame need to do? Let's start there. You're meeting with the team, and you have, right, you're gathering together, probably you or even club and high school, you probably have, really, before you start the warm-up and you collect them together, how many minutes might you have? Five. Five. Five? Five. Five. Right? If five is about right, <coughs> what, what do you do in that time? What, any, any, any thought? What do you do in that five minutes? Key tactical, and then first key tactical points, just quick bullet points, and then and then emotion, get them pumped up. Okay, so it's a balance. Uh, he says a balance, key moment. How many key moments? How many key factors? What would you think? Three. 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 Two. Maybe on the age one. Yep. Right. Well, let's make sure that we repressure the ball. Ball turns over, just repressure. Let's get that done today. That's all. Because maybe if that's where they are, is that one thing might be all. And maybe that's what you've been working on all week in training. So that pre-game should probably also identify with what you've been doing to say, okay, in today's game, let's make sure we get this right. Or these two things. And maybe... Three. That we give them some direction. So that we know going into the game that they can identify with, look, there are certain things that we want to make sure collectively that we're trying to do. That for us, our success at the end of the game, if we take care of these things, we'll feel pretty good about what we've done. Now, in the participation of it, before the game, Five minutes. I will ask you, how much of those five minutes do you call? On average. What would you say? Three. How many would say five? <laughs> how many five? I only have five minutes, so I gotta give them everything. <laughs> So you have this week in training, and you prepare them, and, and there's certain things you're working on. Do we ever, and maybe as a coach, say, hey, what do you think we should focus on today? What, what is it do you think that maybe that we should really hit on today? And allow them to participate in that exercise. And, and now we end up guiding a little bit. And here, Brad Davies isn't here, but he's really good at this. And this is, especially for younger kids, he's really good. And this is why he, he at, at, the, at the root of who he is, he's a teacher first. So he's really good at this. He has, uh, he's been coaching, or has coached uh, Elijah, who is now 11, but he coached him when he was uh, 9 and 10. He would ask a question, and then he would wait. <coughs> He'd ask a question, and in the group, he'd always say, raise your hand. And always, 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 he'd ask a question, and right, there's certain kids that, hand goes up right away. Know the answer. But there's always those kids that take a little bit longer to process the information. Right? Just a little bit longer. <coughs> and if we're going to ask them to participate, maybe allowing for those kids that maybe take a little bit longer processing it, still come up with the right ideas and answers, but allowing them to participate in it. And he's wonderful at that as a teacher of asking a question, waiting, asking a question again, and allowing more hands to go up in participation and asking the kids. He's very good at that. And as a coach, I would ask that we maybe challenge you to do the same thing, that if you're coaching the youth players, especially the young ones, of allowing them to think about it and process it, because the game is all about that. It's all about processing information, thinking. Reasoning, solving problems. And how many times that we want to give them the information? And man, oh man, in my life, in my career, especially early on, I wanted to let them know everything I knew about soccer. Why? It helped my self image. It made me feel better. Right? I wanted to prove 
when I know I was coaching the um, I was coaching the under 15 national team, and I go to a camp. Um, it was the under 14 national team camp, so I'm there as the under 15 coach, just watching because these are players that ultimately we were going to inherit in the 15. And the guy, uh, Manny Shellshite, one of my mentors in coaching, was the guy overseeing the 14. So he was also responsible for bringing in the coaches for the 14, and they had six different coaches there, and the game was going on, and it was just about half time. So he pulls me over and he says, Ken, Ken, come here. He says, watch this. So one of the coaches proceeds, right, pulls the guys in at halftime, he says, watch what's going on. So the guy comes in, pulls him in, and the halftime is about 10 minutes. 10 minutes straight, he talked. And Manny said to me, Ken, Ken, he's never asked them once what they saw. Never asked them once how they feel. And in 10 minutes, he's trying to tell them everything he knows about the game of soccer. He said, how much do you think they'll remember? And it was very powerful for me. And again, in my development and growth is, is limit what our participation in it. And as a coach, can we help guide that? Can we help lead them in a direction and ask questions? <coughs> our halftime, the, um, and ever, anybody that's experienced our halftime, we walk in at halftime at U of L, and the very first thing we do is say, what do you guys see? What's going on? What are we doing well? What are we struggling at? Because I may see it a certain way. But if I don't understand how they're seeing it, I might be talking and not giving them any help in any direction. <clears throat> so even in a pregame, for sure, the pregame is, look, limit it to one, two, three things, and can you have offer them the opportunity to say, what do, we, what, do we, what do we need to do today? What is it that we need to do to be successful? And then at halftime, all right, asking them what, what they see, but then it, reflecting on what? At halftime. If you're at halftime, what do you want to reflect on? That's right. The three points in the beginning of one or two or three. How are we doing it? Right. What went well? Especially in that <coughs> developmental, because we're in the developmental part of it. What went well? What is it that we can say, look, leaving here, we, we had success today? <coughs> And it doesn't necessarily have to do with the results, but what is it that we did well? And again, even going back to those things. I've also found myself very careful about saying too much after the game because of why? Emotion. Emotion. Less said right after, more the next day in training. Because I get to process it. Get to think about it. Because quite honestly, sometimes I thought I saw the game a certain way. I watch it again on film or I think about it, and I go, oh my goodness. It wasn't exactly what I thought. So sometimes holding your tongue for 24 hours or 48 hours and reflecting on it tempers it a little bit for them and for them. Because how are they emotionally? Very high. Maybe even a little bit unstable. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because we talked about this, about making sure after the game that we got together with our players and had at least 10 minutes just to communicate with them. Five, five to 10, and here's why. What we found is this. After a win, we needed to make sure that what we sent them with a little bit of temperance, a little bit of humility. Right? They, they're feeling good about themselves, but making sure that we stay focused and directed and still have the humility. When we lose, they're fragile as it is. And if we left them, having not said anything, what are the thoughts that are going through their mind for the next 24 or 48 hours? Can we give them something of substance to hold on to where they aren't just destroying themselves mentally? Hold them accountable, yes, but at the same time, give them something of saying, hey, look, you know what? We did do this and this well. And you know what? We'll continue to work on that. We're going to get better in that area. 
You know, many times, and I, I, I tweeted this today, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Sometimes without, they leave and they feel that crushed and how, what it does to their spirit, especially at a young age, youth, youth level player. And you say, well, we've got to build that mental toughness. And look, it's about the teaching moments. Holding them accountable, for sure, but also those teaching moments to continue to build them up. There's Danny and Joe. Anything else <coughs> that you guys wanted to add? <coughs> last, last thing is this, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here as well, is what gives us the credibility in front of them? Right? You're up standing in front of them. What is it that allows them to receive the information, process it, and say, yes, this is true. This is what I need to do. Huh? Relationship. Relationship? What else? Well, you got to build on it, I think. I mean, you got to be real and genuine. You got to be able to share with them, and they understand that, you know, you got a purpose. You got um, to be successful in how you measure it's not wins <coughs> and losses, but how they perform. It. And if you're honest with them and, and you're going with the purpose and they, they understand. The credibility comes from you believing in them as well. Also, it goes into um, um, not just the, you know, the knowledge of the game. Obviously, you have the knowledge if you're the head coach and you're in front of them, but then buying into the system and then buying into each other and then you know staying the course. And even after the, a win or a loss, you know, finding the positives and the negatives because sometimes it does matter. You know, we have that the matter speech that we have, you know, it does matter. Sometimes you have to reflect on what we're doing and what we're not doing. And obviously we're not coaching the younger youth kids, we're coaching the upper age kids. So staying the course of the purpose and believing in the purpose and leading by example. You know, what you preach, you know, you need to practice as well. That's what we're trying to do. And I, 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 think, that's, I think that's wonderful. Um, how, how, do we, how do we develop that? To be able to, again, provide that direction, provide that purpose, and give some feedback that they're going to be able to receive. I was just going to, I, I completely agree. I was, I was just going to say that, you know, we get caught up in, in setting goals for our players and setting goals for ourselves and we forget our purpose. You know, and I think a lot of times, you know, yeah, you have these goals of maybe winning, maybe development, whatever it is, but your purpose there is so much greater than that. I think, Sometimes, like, you know, when you say you give your players a minute to think about it, sometimes we need a minute, you know, to process where we're at. And then you get caught up, the emotion of the game is so yeah. huge, you know? And so when, when you take a step back and realize what your purpose is, it makes things so much clearer. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what is it that drives the emotion? It's a competitiveness, isn't it? It really is. It's a competitiveness. And, and keeping that in perspective, that thank goodness, thank God for competing. Really. Because it's only in that, in that environment that we get to challenge ourselves. Look, if it was recreational and we did <coughs> keep score, right? And we did, and we're just out playing, would we really <coughs> put ourselves out there? Would we really challenge ourselves to be our best? I gotta tell you, for me, once you start keeping score, now, now it's on. All right? And the value of that, and I say this to our players, is, is respect the opponent because with that, now you have a chance to really push yourself to be your best. So that competitive and component is so important. But we need to keep it in perspective that it's the competition, not the result. Because we have been in games, and I will be very honest, we've been in games where we won the game, and I've been absolutely disappointed with our team. Because of how we handled ourselves, because we, we didn't play up to our standards. And quite honestly, there's games where we lost, and I said, man, I couldn't be prouder of you. <coughs> did it hurt? It did. The loss hurt. 
But the perspective of it is this, is that we continue to measure the growth of where we started, where we're at, and where we're going. And not just in the soccer, but in that, again, the personal development aspect of it. Are we a better team? Are we more selfless? Are we more disciplined? Do we respect the opponent, the referee, the, the game? <clears throat> And our growth in those areas, we continue to get better. Man, I'm doing my job. Because the reality is this, is at some point, they'll stop playing soccer, at least competitively. So what our responsibility is, is this. It is to teach principles of success, principles that will go on well beyond soccer, life <coughs> principles, that will help them be good husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, good community people that are responsible, that know how to set goals, of know what it's like to then they commit to those goals, know what it's like to have values. There is no better environment, no better microcosm of life and team sports to teach those principles. And we do get caught up in the competitive part of it. But really, that's where the rub is. Iron sharpens iron. And we need that competitiveness to really push ourselves out of our comfort zone, to stretch ourselves, to become more and do more. And it's as coaches that we need to maintain and be really clear on that perspective. And listen, here's where the credibility comes in. The credibility comes in in who you are. That if I'm going to ask my team to be fit, and they're looking at me, and I'm not fit, it's tough for me to ask them. If they're, I'm asking them to be disciplined, and I'm not disciplined in my life. If I'm asking them to be selfless, and I'm not demonstrating that. And this is where it's sometimes hard because each of us want to be and need to be leaders. And as leaders, we step out in front and are very exposed. The credibility comes in being the example that if you were going to ask them to do something, and listen, kids are very perceptive. They know. So I challenge you to be the model, to continue to grow. And as I said out there, to continue to, look, if we, have a, if we have a shot glass and that's all we have to pour out on others, we don't have a whole lot. But if we have a massive mug that's full, now we have so much to offer. Continue to expand who you are so you have more to pour out on others. And I would challenge you, in my life, probably two things have been responsible for that. One is, is surrounding myself with people that are smarter than I am, including a lot of our staff here. Finding a partner that is smarter than I am, right? And here's, here's a little bit of advice for those that maybe aren't married. Somebody once said to me, if you and your spouse are identical, one of you is not needed. <laughs> so, I'm so grateful for that. <clears throat> Mentorship and surrounding yourself with good people. The second thing is reading. The reason why we're, we continue to give out books, and I think I brought them over, we'll continue to do that. Oh, Tina has them, all right? That, that it is the, the greatest way for me, it has been in our lives, of personal development and professional development. That what I have found is by reading 15 minutes a day, I can get through about a chapter a day. And most books are about 15 chapters long. And it, if I continue to do that through my life, that I'm reading two books a month that are rich, that are grounded, that are value-based, all those things that push me to be better in all areas. If I do that, and I continue to do that, of how much now that I have to offer, and what I can find is that doing that and getting through a book in about two weeks, I can learn what it took somebody a lifetime to figure out. And that is massively powerful. 
And it's simply a discipline of 15 minutes a day. How many people have 15 minutes a day? Yeah, probably for the men, probably even on, just on the toilet. <laughs> 15 minutes a day. <laughs> Look, it, it, then, it then provides you more. And I'm not saying you have to read more soccer books, attacking soccer, but it, the, the books we end up giving out are personal development books, are books that simply make you a better person, which then, quite honestly, when you build that relationship, you have so much more to offer to them. And, and really, that's what coaching is about. It's about that. The, the last thing we'll, we'll, we'll see, and this is more emotionally based, but some of the best uh, halftime speeches ever, so that when we were finished here, we're charged and ready to go for the second half uh, of this symposium. What I would ask is that afterwards as well, just grab all your stuff around you and. Uh, <laughs> Two people we want to recognize, people that have brought the most people to the symposium um, this year. There's a group with uh, Dan Martin and David Robinson. Yeah. You guys can stand up. With, uh, all right. Superb. We thank you so much. Two of my favorite uh, leadership books. One is The Servant. The other is Leadership and self Deception. So, ready? All right. Good yeah. There we go. Let's give a hand. We can make our way back over, and we'll get ready for I don't, actually. Still don't have the issue. <laughs> <laughs> I, do have two, I do have two copies of the talent.